Our lesson tonight is on the subject of sacrifice, and it's a very big subject. So let me say a couple of things in introducing the lesson. Paul said in the 12th chapter of the Roman letter that we should offer our bodies to Christ as a living sacrifice. And we're not looking at sacrifice from that angle. We're looking at sacrifice from the angle of sin, that God has always required a sacrifice for sins. The second point I'd like to make about this subject is now that you know the direction we're going, we're not going to have time tonight to cover all of the things that needs to be said about sacrifice for sins. But I do hope you'll find that this lesson tonight is very beneficial. We'll find some things tonight that encourage us to want to be thankful for who we are and thankful to God for the things that he's given for us. And I think we'll also notice tonight that this lesson is very remedial. If you have a good fourth grade education, you're where you need to be tonight. Nothing complicated whatsoever. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In him being Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. We know that God has always required a sacrifice for sin. Even Pharaoh, the heathen, knew something about this subject. In Exodus 8, verse 25, he called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice to your God in the land. Notice he didn't say, Come and sacrifice to me. He knows this about sacrifice. You Hebrews must sacrifice to your God. And you must sacrifice in a particular place. You wouldn't sacrifice in my land. So you'll go across the river and sacrifice to some place that you know about. In this morning's lesson when David sinned against God by numbering Israel, we notice that David offered sacrifices. In 1 Chronicles 21 verse 26, he built an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the name of the Lord. In Exodus chapter 20, a famous chapter because this is what we call the giving of the law to the Israelites, the Ten Commandments had just been given, that's what we call them, by God to Moses and then on to the people. And in Exodus 20, verses 22 through 26, we'll find these words, The Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen, in every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it out of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar that your nakedness may be exposed to on it. We see here that as the law, as the Israelites, and their religion is getting more organized, really it's getting organized in a new way for the first time. The old law being created by God, this is one of the pivotal things about this law of Moses. It's going to require sacrifices. It's going to require burnt offerings. From the beginning of the old law to the law of Christ, God has required blood be shed as a sacrifice for sins. We'll read that in Hebrews chapter 10 and the first 13 verses of the chapter. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things 
can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then they would not have ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and and offering, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Repeat, by that we will have been sanctified the sacrifice, you might say, of the body of Jesus once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifice which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Hebrews 10 first 13 verses. Now, I said this wasn't going to be a very complicated lesson. I forgot about those 13 verses. But the key point is, we've been given the ultimate sacrifice, our Lord. And the secondary point is, it used not to be that way. God's people used to offer sacrifices, all right. And they offered the sacrifices of the blood of bulls and goats, those sacrifices were designed to take away sin as much as could be done under the old law. And what I want us to look at today is we're going to compare the sacrifice of old with the sacrifice of our Lord. We're going to look at New Testament Christianity's sacrifice, Jesus, and compare it with the God-ordained sacrifice of the old law, bulls and goats, etc. And we're going to see what a great blessing God has given us. The first point that I'd like to make tonight comes from Genesis chapter 22 and verses 7 through 13. The story of Abraham and Isaac and, and Abraham offering Isaac as a sacrifice. Animals are different from the Lord in that in their sacrifice, they didn't give their blood without resistance. Let's read verses 7 through 13. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? You see, you and me will never have to ask that question. Harold, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? We don't have to look. We don't have to catch. We don't have to rope. We don't have to trap because our Lord has been given to us. And Abraham said in verse 8, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. They came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son your only son from me then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns 
And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. Why did you offer the ram? Because I could. He was caught in a thicket by his horns. Let's look out over the landscape, Abraham, and find a sacrifice. Okay, I've got one right over here. He's caught in the thicket, you see. I'm going to offer this ram because I can. He's stuck. He's entangled in the thicket. And it's because of that that the selection process has been made. He's easy to catch and easy to put on the altar. No animal wants to die for a Hebrew sin. It would not be instinctive to an animal to say, yes, I'd love to go to the altar and have you kill me and burn me to ash. That'd be a great thing to do. Animals don't know anything about that. Yet consider our Lord's sacrifice in Matthew chapter 16 and see how different that is from the lamb. Matthew 16, starting in verse 20, Jesus commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. I've got to go to be sacrificed and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And it was instinctive for his followers to say, as Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, far be it from you, Lord, this should not happen to you. It wouldn't be natural for Jesus to want to go to Jerusalem to be treated like a filthy dog and to be killed by these Roman guards as he was hung on the cross, any more than it would be natural for the ram to say, I'd love to go to the altar for you guys. Why don't you pick me? But that's just what Jesus did. He did something unnatural. It would not have been natural for an animal to want to give his life on the altar. So if you can get a picture of this, as a as a member of the nation of Israel is going to sacrifice a sheep or a bull on the altar, I guess you'd grab him by a hind leg and drag him to the altar. And he would be kicking and bellowing and trying to free himself from the grip of man all the way to the altar. I don't want to go there. I don't want to, whatever you're doing to me, I don't know. If you've ever been on a farm and you've ever cut young bull calves, you want to do that when they're pretty young because if they get up to about 250 pounds, you might be the one getting cut. And that's just to get cut. We're not talking about cutting your throat and feeding you on the plate this afternoon. We're just talking about cutting you and making a steer out of you. They don't like it. Well, that's what the Hebrews had to put up with all the time. Every time, every time you make a sacrifice, you have to catch an animal and drag it to the altar because it doesn't want to go there. And here's our Lord. Here's the sacrifice God gave to us. I'm going to set my mind to go to Jerusalem and nothing can stop me from giving my life on the cross. I'm going to get treated worse than any animal you've ever sacrificed. But that's God's will. That's what I came here to do, and that's what I'm going to do. Don't you wish that the Jews could have understood this? Why would you want to sacrifice for your sins an animal that's going to resist you every step of the way when God has given you his son? If you had to make a choice, which do you think would be more effective in heaven taking away sin? This ram or this lamb? Comparison number two between Old Testament sacrifice and new. Animal sacrifices were taken from the field and had to be captured while Jesus was a gift from heaven. I don't have to go into the field and find a lamb that's without spot or blemish. 
find a way to catch it. We're already there, Genesis 22, verses 7 and 13. We've already made some reference to this. Abraham's offering was caught in a thicket. He's going to offer a ram that was caught by the thicket. That's what qualified that ram for sacrifice. There's no other criteria. We need a sacrifice, and God has providentially provided one for us. He's standing in the woods right behind me, and the primary reason I'm choosing him is because he's caught in a thicket, and I can get my hands on him. He's not going to run away from me. What a different sacrifice system that is compared to the ones that you and I probably take for granted every day, don't we? Compare that to this in 1 Corinthians 15, and you can mark this because we'll be coming back to this chapter at the close of the lesson, God willing. Verses 45 through 47. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. Common sense tells you what we ought to long for. Would you like a sacrifice for you that's in the field? Or would you like one from heaven? Which one do you think would be more powerful, more holy, more effective? Which one do you think would take away more sins? And yet the Jews of the first century continued to cling to that old law. I know we know more about putting this in context than they did, but what a shame they never saw. The law you cling to is so inferior to the sacrifice God gave us from heaven. Comparison number three, the animals were food for people's physical nourishment while the Christ nourishes our souls. In Luke, the father of the prodigal son said he was going to put on the fatted calf because that's what we do with calves. And we put on the fatted calf and then what? Tomorrow we're hungry and we're looking for something else to eat. But our Lord nourishes, he feeds our souls, and that nourishing can be, if we allow it to be, a constant process. Will you turn to John chapter 6 and look at verses 64 through 69? I know you're familiar with these passages. You've heard them many times over the years. Jesus said, there are some of you, his followers, who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And he said to the twelve apostles, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Compare animal sacrifice to Jesus the Christ. Comparison number three. He has the words of eternal life. What does that animal have to offer? A meal that will make us hungry again, probably in 8 to 10 to 12 hours. What a difference our Lord is when it comes to the sacrifice business. Comparison number four. The animals never did anything for anybody but graze grass and provide food on the table, while our sacrifice performed miracles and changed people's lives. Just a quick example found in Matthew chapter 9. Imagine the difference in the two sacrifices here. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 23 
When Jesus came into the ruler's house, that would be Darius, and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead but sleeping, and they ridiculed him. They're playing the flute. If you ever go to a uh, funeral and you walk in early at the funeral home, you're likely to hear organ music or piano music mourning the passing of someone. And that's what they were doing here with the flute. And they were a noisy crowd wailing. They were weeping over the tragedy of losing this young girl. And Jesus said he's going to raise her from the dead. She's not dead but sleeping and they ridiculed him. You've got to be kidding. What kind of, a, what kind of an idiot are you? We know who this girl is and we know she's dead. What are you going to do about that? Nothing. Now leave us alone to our flute playing and our wailing. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand and she arose. And this report went out into all the land. And Jesus departed from there and two blind men followed him crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he'd come into the house, the blind men said to him, or came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. You see what our sacrifice has the power to do? And what about the sacrifice of bulls and goats? When I was a kid, we used to watch the Ed Sullivan show. I'm sorry for dating myself. But now and then, Ed had this guy on the show. He, he had these trained poodles. And they had them groomed to the max. And these poodles used to jump through hoops and do all kinds of tricks. And when I was eight or nine years old, I thought that was pretty cool. But that's about the best you're going to get out of an animal, folks. Maybe some casual entertainment, because that's the best they can offer you. And that's the sacrifice of the Jew. Consider what God has given us. Our sacrifice came from heaven. Our sacrifice has the power to make the blind to see. Our sacrifice raised the dead. Let me put these things down. He quieted the storm. He fed 5,000. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. He made the blind to see. He made the lame to walk. He cleansed the lepers. And he cast out demons. Which sacrifice would you want for your sins? And that ought to be the message of this congregation to this lost world. We not only have a sacrifice for sins, he's the son of God from heaven and he's a powerful, wonderful, great sacrifice, vastly superior to the sacrifice those Hebrews knew long ago. Why did they choose? Now, we, we, don't, we don't want to believe in Jesus. What did these blind men have to do to get healed? Do you believe I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, okay, I'm able to do this. I'm able to do this because your faith has enabled me to do this for you. And yet so many Pharisees, legalistic as they were back in the first century, when Jesus had died on the cross, I don't want that sacrifice for me. I want to stay here with the blood of bulls and goats. I want to continue the ritualism. Why? Our last comparison, I've left a comparison or two off because I didn't want to be too lengthy tonight. But there are other things. You can think about other things in your own time. How much superior our sacrifice is to the old Jews. Number five, what does an animal do after having been sacrificed? This is one of the key things in the lesson. They would be consumed by the fire. What would one get from a burnt offering after the sacrifice was made? I've put the blood of bulls and goats on the altar, and we've offered it as a burnt offering, and after it's been offered, what 
do we get out of it? I guess just a heap of ash. Nothing. What a difference our Lord is after having been sacrificed, he was raised from the dead. <laughs> you see the difference? You see how superior he is to the sacrifices made of old? You get nothing from your sacrifices after you sacrifice them. And look what we get. Our Lord was raised from the dead. Back to 1 Corinthians in chapter 15. We'll close the lesson tonight by reading these eight verses. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died, there's the sacrifice, for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. What a great sacrifice. When you stop and think about it, God has given us his son. He sacrificed his life for our sins on the old rugged cross. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And another great thing about our sacrifice, Acts chapter 1, he ascended and now sits at the right hand of the throne of God. How do you compare that great sacrifice to animal sacrifices of the old law? There's no comparison at all. Do you see what we have to be thankful for? Because God gave us this sacrifice. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If we have anyone in the audience tonight who's been pricked in their heart by the study of the sacrifice. And if you'd like to get in a right relationship with God, I think most here have been baptized. If not, the waters of baptism are prepared. But for those who might need to make some correction and change the direction in their life, putting the sacrifice first, we want to encourage you to come, if you will, while we stand and sing.